It's really fantastic. So thank you all for being here. It's nice to see, you know, see the wonderful panelists here. And I want to thank the Bronx Documentary Center for having us. Um, you know, I'm just quickly to say that the BDC holds a really special place in my heart. We all kind of started at the same time, roughly 10 years ago, Photoville and the BDC. And it's been such a special friendship and partnership that we have done. And the work that they do with folks of all ages, and I know you're all here, it's, you're all range in so many different ages, is inspiring. And I think that it's one of the things that I feel like there should be a lot more of when we talk about collaboration and sharing of information and knowledge. And this is what hopefully the next hour is going to be. And it's, you know, careers in the arts. And I think it's a really diverse and wonderful panel that we all are here because we come from very different backgrounds. And so my name is Laura Romanis. And I, my background is I'm a theater geek. I grew up in Australia, I'm Lebanese. Um, I, so I come from an immigrant family in Australia. And so the idea of having a career in theater or the arts was kind of unheard of. But I had a really wonderful mother who when I was young, she knew I loved performing and I loved everything. And so uh, when I was 15, she actually helped me audition for a performing arts high school in Sydney. And then through there, I went and got my, um, and I kind of wanted to be an, an actor, um, but I discovered producing. And so I went to school and I basically ended up being here in US 16 years ago and started off in general management's office at Manhattan Theatre Club, which is a Broadway theatre company, nonprofit Broadway theater company and then went over to St. Anne's Warehouse, which is my heart here in Dumbo. And I was producing and working on the most craziest large scale theatrical and music programs, everything from Lou Reed and Stu. Um, we did outside Shakespeare's with Polish companies, Irish, Scottish, you name it. Um, it was there I actually met my now husband and partner of crime of Photoville, um, Sam Barzillet, and also Dave Shelley. But I love storytelling. And so I also, you know, started working at Creative Time, doing a lot of different um, public art uh, projects. And I've been working on so many different things. So theater and music, I've worked with Karen O and the Yeah, Yeah, Yeahs, uh, BAM, uh, the Brooklyn Youth Chorus, you name it, I've done it. I even produced a fashion show on the Metropolitan Opera with um, Spike Jones and Jonah Hill wrote a play. And so I produced it at the Met, which was a lot of fun. Um, I've done live events. I've produced a lot of major festivals in the city of future storytelling, the World Science Festival. You can see here my little Gilbert who passed away a few years ago on the Mars rover, NASA, the NASA folks let me put him there. Um, that was a lot of fun. And then there is Photoville. So the last 10 years, I've done a lot of that while building Photoville and with my team, Jasmine included. And so we have our big photo festival. We dive in education, public works all over. And here are some really fun photos you can see here of the things that we've done over the 10 years. Um, it hasn't been easy, um, but we've been able to really be able to tell stories and share stories. And that's what it's really about. And then I'm gonna end by saying, this is me living the glamorous life. I actually was working at Photoville, 39 weeks pregnant. You could see that huge belly of mine. Um, this photo here is me not being happy about a photographer taking a photo of me when I was five months pregnant, throwing up every five seconds in Berlin. And then, uh, you know, again, it's not glamorous. At four in the morning, you are doing press checks in Long Island City because of your catalog that's supposed to be up and running the next day. So... You know, working in the arts is fun, it's amazing, but it's a lot of hard work which we're gonna hear about. So I wanna now pass this over to my wonderful colleague and friend, Noelle Flores. Hi, it's such an honor to be here. And um, like Laura said, for me, the BDC has always had a special place. I feel like when I was a teenager, I would have dreamt of such a place to exist. I grew up in El Paso, Texas and took photo classes at the community college and, um, you know, did whatever I could to learn as much as I could. But it's just incredible to see the community that's being built. So 
if there's any internet issues, you all let me know. I do have my phone as backup. I'm currently in Puerto Rico. Um, Laura was laughing because, you know, this is also part of the life of being a creative is being able to go with the flow and make it work. I also have a young daughter. She's seven. I have a house full of family here in Puerto Rico. And so the car is the safest place to be um, or the best place to be for now. So long and windy road. I think that that's the key here is that, you know, my parents, everyone always thought I was crazy. So like Noelle is somebody who just like follows her passion. Right. And I have to say that that was largely possible because I also had parents that really supported that. Um, and, you know, in, in number, a number of different ways, including financially. So that's the other piece is, you know, got to put it out there. Just, it's true that, you know, um, my parents were able to pay for me to go to college. I went to the University of Texas at Austin. I studied journalism and I became very, very obsessed with my own cultural history. So my father is Haitian. Um, he's Haitian, but he was what you might call Metis. So he often gets, um, people think he's, you know, Habibi or like, you know, maybe Arabic or, you know, maybe light-skinned African-American, but he came to the United States in 1963. And at that moment, he kind of, you know, had to rethink his own racial identity. And so um, I became very, very serious about trying to go to Haiti. So I applied for a Fulbright. Um, Maggie Steber came to the University of Texas and she was the editor at the Miami Herald. And I moved to Miami just to be closer to Haiti and my family had a place for me to stay. And I introduced myself and I applied for a Fulbright and I didn't get the Fulbright, I failed. But I did manage to get an internship with the Miami Herald thanks to Maggie Steber. So around the 200th anniversary in 2004, I went down and I made these pictures. So this is a picture of that. Um, I was maybe 22 at the time. Um, we can maybe go to the next slide. Um, so another very big passion of mine, in addition to Haiti was, you know, gl like global hip hop. So we kind of take it for granted now, but like at the turn of the millennium, I was really interested in how international young people were basically like taking hip hop and making it their own. And so I kind of got a backpack and, you know, traveled, um, throughout Latin America. So this is actually in Caracas, Venezuela, where, um, it was a youth prison, so they'd actually created a radio station in the prison. So I just basically photographed for many years, and I was, um, I'm somebody who, I, I also have immigrant parents, so like my father's Haitian, my mother's French. You can never have too many degrees, like their receipts, no one can never take them away from you, was like kind of the mantra in the family. So um, I did do a master's in African diaspora studies at Florida International University in Miami. Um, turns out you can't just take pictures in academia. You have to get something called IRB research on human subjects. And so I decided, I think the next, hopefully the next image is Jamel. I ended up um, writing a thesis, 60 page thesis on the work of Jamel Shabazz. So essentially I had to shift from being a practitioner, a taker of pictures. In order to finish that degree, I had to just kind of like really think about what I wanted to write about. and. Um, Jamel was incredibly generous with his time. I wrote um, a thesis about his work and I looked at how his work touched on these four kind of critical moments in black cultural history. So the black um, arts, oh, sorry, the black aesthetic movements of the 1900s, so like the Harlem Renaissance and that kind of thing. Um, the black arts movement, which of course he was, you know, brought up in that era. He was born in 1960. So he was a young, he was a child when, you know, the black arts movement was really taking off, but it made a huge impression on him hip hop culture, which is what he's most known for. But, you know, the more you talk to Jamel, the more you realize he happened to photograph the culture and he happened to put love forward in terms of, you know, really take good, great care in the subjects and the people that he photographed and made them look beautiful and amazing. Um, but he's not necessarily a hip hop photographer. So really looking carefully at the legacy of his work and the importance of it. And then also in the 2000s, there was this kind of diaspora aesthetic movement. So like, you know, like what we're seeing now, these investments in black joy and representations of black joy, you know, Jamel's work really taps into that so beautifully. So, so yeah, I put on another hat and, um, and then again, um, another interest. So the kind of the next big project I did was called One Drop. And my colleague, um, Dr. Yaba Blay, uh, I met her at FIU, she was getting her PhD there. And she wanted to do a book on, um, essentially it's called one drop. So um, it's people who might present as white or white passing, but who identify as black. So this is 
maybe kind of an odd, more obvious example, you know, Tiana has albinism. And so a lot of times she's mis mistaken for white, but I was also a subject in the book. Um, so I ended up having my photograph taken as well. Um, and so I was, you know, again, for me, like really understanding like this idea of like following your passion for me has always been the path. So um, I forgot what I put next. Let's see, let's see. Am I taking too much time? Are we good for time? Um, okay, so this is, I went to graduate school, third degree, all right, the joke is more, more degrees than a thermometer, um, but I figured, you know what, I really want to teach, I really wanted to teach, and, and interestingly, like, I don't necessarily consider myself a practitioner, even as I was a practitioner, there was always this, like, grading thing in the back of my head that's like, I think I'm more of a teacher, um, so I worked in Sunset Park, Brooklyn, um, there was a rent strike that was happening, and so I provided disposable cameras to the residents there. They photographed things like broken toilets and problems in the building, things that ended up getting put in as evidence against their slumlord, and actually they won the case in court. But on the flip side, I was interested in the neighborhood and just the energy in Sunset Park was really so beautiful. So I wanted to make sure that we captured some of that, you know, life essence as well. And I ended up meeting my partner, husband, and having a baby shortly after. So that life took a whole different path. Um, so speaking of, for those of you all that end up deciding to have children, um, it's totally possible. It definitely has its challenges. Um, I had my daughter at 34, so I wasn't, you know, a spring chicken. Um, and there were certainly a lot of challenges, but I did find out that for me, kind of shepherding or, um, this role of the support, the support role, actually, I, I finally realized that actually there's an art and a craft and a skill to that. And that's where I would like to invest my energy next. So I spent five years as program officer at the Magnum Foundation. So Laura, you were just saying like St. Anne's is your heart. Magnum Foundation is my heart, like forever. Like that's, you know, an organization and institution that I respect so much. And I was just so lucky to have worked there. Um, but five years in, I kind of got drawn away um, for kind of a position that if I, you know, if you told me 20 years ago, I'd be in this role, I would have been elated. Um, so I'm senior digital photo editor at The New Yorker, where I am uh, producing photo booth. So essentially, you know, everybody pitches, um, once those decisions are made, writers are assigned, and then I'm the person that kind of builds out the websites. I'm also doing a lot of commissioning of photography, which is interesting, and then just pulling pictures off the wire. So if you read a story about God forbid, I don't want to say the past president's name, but whatever's in the news, you know, I'm tasked to find pictures for that. So that's what I'm doing now. Um, I think the last slide, I just wanted to encourage you all, you know, I am not somebody who, um, anyway, I, I just learned about the value of LinkedIn, actually. Um, and, you know, for those of you all that are interested in like seeking jobs in administration or being editors for the rest of it, um, it's not too soon to start building out that profile um, and to start putting alerts on things, right? So, you know, I have an alert for photo editor and I have a group of students that I've taught at Parsons and I send them everything that I find. In fact, BBC folks, I'm happy to just send it your way or you just put the alert in and then you can start to see what kind of jobs exist in the industry. Um, and there's ways into the industry and pathways into the industry. Um, so, you know, just... A, a word of encouragement that, you know, it is hard to create, you know, to have a career in the arts, but it's, it's possible. Um, and I also, you know, the doors open, I'll share my email for those of you all that are here, I'm more than happy to stay in touch. So I'll pass it off. I hope that wasn't too long. Handing it, handing it over. It was perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Noelle. So I'm going to hand this over to Cynthia now. Hi, um, I'm gonna first apologize if you hear music really loud in the background. It's like right outside my window, but it'll be my soundtrack for now. Um, so I started, well, middle school and high school, which I think is important. I started at the New York City Museum School, and I feel like that was kind of, it used to be a school where we did modules and we did projects each kind of semester and we got to go to museums and we had our classrooms in museums and I was always around art so I feel like that's kind of how my pathway was like shaped into being where I am now um but so after that I went to SVA for a year um to study photography and then I transferred to FIT which is where I learned all of my really important technical skills um 
But within that, I actually didn't study fashion and I started to work on my own personal projects that happened to be documentary work. Um, and during that time, I was maybe one of two students that was working on documentary photography because a lot of people were working on fashion. Um, but I tried my best to like stick to it and find photographers that I really loved. And um, one of my mentors in school was really inspirational and he really pushed me to really understand what storytelling was because I didn't understand what it was at the time. Um, but then during college, I actually interned, I volunteered first at the BDC um, because of a friend who's actually a really amazing teacher there now. Her name is Jess Kirkham and she found the BDC first and she was like, this is a really great place. You need to come and volunteer here. You're going to love the people here. Um, the founder was friends with Tim Hetherington, who was one of my favorite photographers. Um, and that was the whole reason why I went one day on a really rainy day to help Mike package all of his books. It was the first book that he made during the time. Um, and that was the first day I was there. And that was kind of a moment of, even though we were in the basement and it was really dirty and there was just kind of things everywhere and it wasn't the BDC that it is today. Um, it was just one building and we were working out of the gallery and the basement. Um, and even though it was kind of all of that, it was the place that I knew I wanted to be a part of um, and help in any way that I could. So I continued volunteering. And then while I was still in college, um, they gave me an internship because I needed to, to graduate. Um, so I continued there and interned. And while I was interning, um, at the time, there was only maybe four people working there. I can't fully remember, but everybody kind of did everything. So as an intern, I also did everything. Um, and that was kind of how I learned all of these small skills, whether it was administrative work or it was installing a show or how to use a screw gun or, what the process is in photo editing and what the process is in curating an exhibition. Um, I just got to, because we're such a small organization, I got to work alongside Mike and Bianca and Jess, who was also interning there. Um, and we got to learn from each other and understand what the whole process is like from the ground up. And that was a really important experience. And after I interned, it was kind of, over and I had to, and I kept volunteering and then college was over and I had to look for a job. And the really hard part about that was that I had already been in a place that I knew that I wanted to be, but I couldn't work there at the moment because they weren't hiring anyone. Um, so I just stayed volunteering and I worked customer service for a long time. Um, and then because I volunteered and because I kind of stuck with the BDC and really made it known that this is a place that I wanted to be. Um, when they started an exhibition that they needed help with, I was the person that they, that Mike called. And he was like, hey, we really need someone to help with this exhibition, which was Altered Images. Um, and we really need someone to help with research and help put the exhibition together. And that was the first time I like really started working there. And then, from there, it was just the place that I knew I was going to stay. <laughs> um, and we continue, well, this is from our Latin American Photo Festival, which this year is going to be our fourth year in a row. And <laughs> I see Laura clapping. Um, and this is also, I guess, an experience of after being at the BDC for, in terms of volunteering, interning, and then working there, I've been there for almost eight years, I think. And within those eight years, I've learned like everything that I needed to know to work there, to coordinate exhibitions, to manage exhibitions, to print and install and like literally build exhibitions from the ground up with all of our volunteers and people that work with me. And um, it's kind of like understanding what you really Sorry, there's a lot of horns in the background. <laughs> um, within this, it helped me to understand like where I really wanted to be and what I really wanted to do. And for me, that stemmed from being at the museum school and seeing all of these different galleries and exhibitions and then placing myself 
like to where I am today and being the person that does that, it was a very, felt like a very natural, gradual process. And it, it's not that it was easy. It took a lot of work and time and hours, like Noelle said. Um, but it's definitely, you kind of like when you find your place, you have to like really work hard and stick to it, especially when you're in the arts, which is probably going to be mentioned throughout this entire time. <laughs> Um, and I will mention the other thing, which now since we're on the slide, is that um, apart from doing all of the BDC stuff, which is another difficult thing about being an artist and working in the arts and working for other organizations at the same time, is that you also want to do your own work. Um, and even though it does take a lot of time, it's not something you should let go of. You have to really make the time for it, um, which means sometimes working like 18, 20 hours a day. <laughs> and it's not all the time, but it's like, if you're really passionate about what you wanna do separate from where you're working, you still really need to do it. And this is one of the things that um, I'm working on now, which is uh, creating these music videos for Kelly Scar, who's a singer and musician. Um, and they're going to be projections. They're like sensorial projections, but I do, make work apart from being at the BDC. So that's all I have to say. <laughs> I will say I am, Cynthia's only recently shared this information with me and I am like obsessed with your work as you're so talented. So thank you. So I am going to, and we're gonna be diving into so much more of this later on, but I'm now gonna pass this over to my colleague at Photovilla, my friend, uh, Jasmine Chang. Um, hi everyone. Hey, I'm Jasmine. Um, I'm going to start off uh, by talking a little bit about kind of how I got here and then I'll talk about what I do. So this, um, this set of pictures, I, I think I drew maybe five years ago. Um, a teacher invited me to come to a career day and asked me to kind of talk about how I got where I am. And I was like, there are just so many different little things and I had to just, I was like, I think the only way that I can kind of make sense of this in my mind and to share with somebody is to start drawing. So starting from the top, um, so I grew up in Southern California, um, also in uh, like an Asian immigrant community. Um, I, I think things from when I was little, little, um, I always really loved art. Um, really loved visual art and taking art classes. Um, I was also very shy, which I think like doing art and photography has, that's, I'll talk more about that, but I think that has been um, something that's really helped me to kind of connect more with people. Um, and I also, I, I grew up with a lot of my cousins and I was the oldest cousin and I did a lot of making activities for my cousins to do like, uh, art projects, I would do summer camps for them. And I think that actually plays a lot into the role that I do now. So those are things that I remember from when I was little. Um, and kind of moving forward from that, I really, I think in the community that I grew up in, art just, it never really crossed my mind as something that was a job, something that I could do as a career. Um, it was very much like, a hobby that I love to draw. And um, I think for me in high school, I joined the yearbook staff and like that was very much an aha moment for me. Like thinking about yearbook, thinking about kind of taking photos and making stories, it just made sense to me. And those kind of became like my people and how I thought and what I wanted to do. And so from yearbook, I decided, okay, well the closest thing to yearbook in real life would be working at a magazine. So um, I'm gonna go to school for journalism. So I went to school um, at Northwestern. I went to journalism school there. Um, and I kind of learned in my freshman year that it's like, I liked journalism, but I felt like everyone around me loved writing more than me. So I was like, okay, well maybe I like visual journalism. Maybe I like taking photos. And so I did some classes in there and then added an art major. Um, and, and I think it was, I feel like something that kind of goes through the how I got here is like, 
I kept kind of veering and trying things. And then I would be like, wait a minute, this doesn't totally feel right. Or I feel like I want to like shift it a little bit. And like, I think I can sometimes be pretty stubborn, but I feel like listening to kind of those little shifts when I've been like, ah, something feels like I want to try something a little different. That's been, that's been really helpful for me. So I added an art major and then I started kind of exploring as internships. Um, I started exploring some internships at museums. I started exploring some internships at magazines um, and at art departments in magazines. And um, at the end of college, I kind of landed on, I think I want to be a photographer. I think I want to be a photographer who works for magazines and goes out on assignments for magazines. So, um, so my first job out of college was working for a photographer as a photography assistant. And I learned while working with her that um, I was like, I think kind of similarly to what Noelle said, um, I learned that I didn't really, I, I didn't love taking photographs and I didn't love kind of the life of being like an independent artist as much as kind of being in a supportive role, kind of being in a space of working with lots of different artists and kind of working with them to support their work. And so I decided to try doing that. And with that, I moved to New York, thinking that I wanna to move to New York. I wanna find a job at a museum or a job at some place where I can work with a lot of artists. And so came here, um, I applied for a million jobs um, and kept applying and kept applying. And I think learn, learned very quickly that finding a full-time job in the arts is really hard. Um, but um, it was during that time, I moved here about 10 years ago um, that I met and connected with the folks at Photoville, um, worked on the first Photoville festival. And while learned that kind of, while it was hard to find one full-time job, I did find lots of organizations and lots of people in New York who were doing really interesting things. Um, and so spent like met most of the last 10 years doing lots of freelance projects with lots of different organizations. Um, I've always, you know, worked with Photoville. I've worked with Noel at the Magnum Foundation, um, lots of different things. And um, now I'm working full-time at Photoville. Um, I have my, what I do at Photoville is I'm the deputy director here and I wear lots of different hats at Photoville. And I think I've learned to wear lots of different hats um, from freelancing and working in so many projects and so many different jobs. Um, my focus at Photoville is that I work on our education projects, focusing, um, working with teachers and working with teens and connecting them to the stuff that we do at Photoville. Um, and I also work on uh, community projects. So connecting with people and connecting with community members um, on doing work. Um, so I think um, with every project that we do, my role's a little different. So I put together these photos to show like some things that I really love about my job. Um, so one, well, the last photo was me standing with a lot of people. Oftentimes I have a megaphone, but with public art and with what we do, I get to share stories with a lot of people and that's really exciting. Um, and going to the next one, this is a project called Community Heroes that I work on in my neighborhood. Um, and I get to work with community and so many different people to tell stories and to show stories. And working with people is something that I really love about my job. Um, and then the next slide, um, I think part of working in the arts is also just getting creative about how you do what you do. So. This is um, last year and kind of working to um, tell some stories of community members. Um, we did some Zoom sessions with family members to like do some oral histories. Um, and then we needed to meet up to scan some photos. And so we just met in the park and brought a laptop and kind of made it happen. So really getting creative. Um, and then um, this is a teacher, a lab for teachers that we do. Um, and what I really love about this is that I get to kind of create spaces for people to come together and brainstorm and work together. 
Um, and that's also what I want to show in the next photo, um, which is, this is a project that I finished recently called the Winston-Salem Portrait Project. And over a few years, um, a good friend and colleague of mine, Kisha Bari, and I worked on a project um, in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, where we got to get community members together um, to come together to take photos of each other and get to know each other and work on an art project together. And we, together over the last few, three years with a hundred community members, we built this sculpture that's gonna be up in the city. Um, so yeah, I think what I would say my job is now is really like bringing people together um, to work on storytelling and work on art together. Definitely, thank you, Jasmine. You're the best, love it. Um, so I'm really, uh, that's not me. <laughs> um, I'm really honored and Nadia has joined us. So hi, Nadia. Um, thank you. I think she's gonna unmute and put her, turn her camera on, but we're really honored. Hey, <laughs> um, to have Nadia here. So Nadia is going to talk a bit about what she does and then we will dive into the group conversation. Hey everyone, um, my name is Nadia Hallgren and uh, I am a documentary filmmaker and cinematographer. I'm born and raised in the Bronx. I grew up in uh, Soundview section of the Bronx. Um, and I had my very first uh, exposure to documentary um, as a teenager. I, uh, my mom found a newspaper article that was advertising free photography classes at a place called ICP at the point. And this was a, uh, a community run organization, which many of you may know that I had partnered with uh, International Center of Photography to teach kids how to take photos. And I went there because I had nothing better to do and I was getting in a lot of trouble and my mom was hoping I would find something that was interesting to me and I did. Um, so in that program, uh, we were given Pentax K1000 cameras and a roll of black and white film and told to kind of walk around the neighborhood and take photos and um, come back. We learned how to process and develop our own film and I remember it just being the most exhilarating experience that I had had at that point in my young life. And I was immediately hooked on it. But I, I joined this program where uh, there had been uh, kids who were there before me and they were really good photographers. And I immediately decided that I sucked and I was not a good photographer. And I didn't give myself a chance to get good, which is very important for you all. Um, and so I figured I love doing this, but I have to figure out a different way to do it where I'm, I'm not so outclassed in, in my ability. So um, someone had given me a video camera and I won't age myself, but this was back when like no one had video cameras and we didn't have cell phones to have video cameras on or anything like that. So someone gave me a video camera, which was amazing. And I started to kind of go out and shoot little films with the kids that I was taking photography classes with. Um, and I started making films and uh, eventually I, I cut a very short documentary film that uh, played in the South Bronx Film Festival, which meant there were like five people there and they all lived on the block. And I didn't think anything of it. And I, I showed my film at this festival and it turned out that um, the folks who through the festival were very good friends with a documentary film producer. And this woman uh, had been Michael Moore's uh, main producer and she saw my film and she uh, came up to me after and she was like, you, you made a really cool film. And I was kind of like, whatever, um, cause the film wasn't great, but uh, I put the effort in and I think she, she knew that. And at that moment, I didn't know who she was but she was being very complimentary. And she told me she worked in film and gave me her card and we stayed in touch. And uh, eventually she called me one day and she said, uh, I'm working on a new film with Michael Moore and uh, I can give you a job as a production assistant. And uh, would you want that job? And I was like, amazing, I never worked in film. And 
I showed up for work. I had no idea what was going on and I was a terrible production assistant, but they didn't give up on me. And uh, turns out that uh, the, the person who was the cinematographer on that film was a woman named Kirsten Johnson, who uh, turned out, she, it turns out she's like one of the most well-known uh, cinematographers and women cinematographers on top of that. And, after, and I met her and I realized that I wanted to be a cinematographer and I asked her if she would mentor me and she said yes. And that set me on the path of the very, very long and hard journey to learning how to become a cinematographer. So that was my original path. As you can see in this film, in this image, where I'm filming Mrs. Obama, um, I still shoot all my own films and uh, in a very sort of basic way that I started. And you can see it in that photo. I don't have any like rigs or fancy lenses or anything like that. Um, but to get to the story of how that even happened was, um, so I dedicated all of my energy and uh, decided that I wanted to be very specifically a verite cinematographer, which means my focus was on observational handheld cinematography. And I decided I wanted to be the best verite cinematographer ever. And so I spent many years just uh, shooting on any film that I was invited to and um, try to develop this craft uh, and, and, and try not even understand what that meant. Um, and I did that for a long time. I have worked as a cinematographer on uh, many, many doc, probably like 50 plus documentaries, if not more. Uh, I've won Sundance Awards, shortlist of Academy Awards, nominated for Academy Awards, et cetera. Um, but you know, the journey, just like sort of everyone that has come before me to speak, it's been very long and challenging. Uh, it's it's a it's a lifelong commitment to be um, an image maker. It's a, a a quest of understanding so many things, and I feel like every time I even go out in the field to do anything, I just realize that how little I know about anything. Um, you know, you're always making mistakes, even if you know better. And then you go back and look at the footage. And even today, I was in an edit. And I was like, oh, what stupid thing are you going to do next? You know, as I look at my footage and I move the camera at the wrong time or I do these things that, you know, you sort of know better, but so much of it is staying tremendously focused and um, not giving up on yourself or the things that you're trying to achieve. Um, so I, again, I, so I, I went from being a production assistant to a camera assistant to a very low paid cinematographer on super low budget documentaries. Uh, which is where I kind of was able to build the craft to then working my way up to actually becoming a top tier cinematographer. And I did that for, for quite a long time. Um, and then about six years ago, I decided that I wanted to, I wanted something, a different challenge um, as if being a cinematographer wasn't challenging enough, but I just wanted a different challenge. And also the physical wear and tear that the work had kind of put on my body was was weighing on me and I needed to, to figure out a way to take a little bit of a break. So I decided to um, start directing. And um, I started directing short films and I did a couple of short films and I did a short digital series. And then I got a phone call one day of someone asked me if I wanted to make a documentary about Michelle Obama. and. Uh, I wish I could share the details of all of that with you, but I don't have enough time. Ultimately, uh, really, I guess the point of, uh, uh, of this was that all those skills that I had developed coming up in uh, low budget documentaries and really sort of difficult circumstances where I didn't have a big team, I didn't have a big crew, was the thing that landed me this job. The main, one of the main uh, abilities for the person that was making this film was being able to one, shoot their own film. The director had to be able to shoot themselves. They also had to be able to work with a very small crew, possibly alone, um, because just the way Mrs. Obama moves, Secret Service, Jets, all this stuff, there just wasn't a lot of space for there to be many people. And because um, I kind of had that skill set, uh, I, I was probably one of the, the few candidates for this job that could do all those things because even when I was out, you know, working with Michael, 
they used to send me in the field with a camera, backpack, headphones, like a mic, and I would have to mic people and like do all this stuff. And so I kind of learned the basics of doing that. And that's pretty much the way that we made Becoming. Um, it's not very different. And um, so, yeah, so now I um, make feature length documentaries, primarily for Netflix. Um, and I'm currently making a documentary about attorney Benjamin Crump, who is the lead attorney for uh, the George Floyd family, Breonna Taylor, many others. And uh, this past year, I have been working um, with attorney Crump uh, in the field and with all these sort of the experiences that he's been having. So that's my story. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. I'm definitely in awe of you and everyone else here, I will say that. And I would say we'll put in the links um, for the trailers for those films that you've been making, Nadia. And it's kind of amazing. So how long were you working as a cinematographer then? Like, like thinking, was it 10 years? It was about 12 years I worked as a cinematographer before I started directing, yeah. Yeah. And I think this is kind of a key thing. I think sometimes I think we're all in a rush. I think we're you know, this 24 hour news cycle, we want this, but it takes a long time to get to where many of us are. I mean, even like Cynthia, you talking about like being at the BDC for many years and before you were an employee even. And I think it's about persistence. Um, what's great, I know we have like limited time, but we, I think everyone has kind of answered probably the first four questions I was gonna ask anyway, which is about aha moments. What did we wanna do when we were younger? Um, so it's definitely one of them, but I do wanna ask all of you, um, which is talking about some of the challenges that you've had to overcome. So what were the things that, especially now, even let's talk about the last year, what have been some of those challenges that you've had to overcome in order to do what you, you're doing? And maybe Nadia, I'll ask you first. Yeah, I mean, I think I'll start with the early years, you know, again, like I, I decided I wanted to work in documentary filmmaking, especially at a time when there were very few women, very, pe very few people of color um, that were in the field period. So just showing up to set and feeling like I was uh, not, I just didn't even belong there, you know? And I would say, I think the other thing that I, I definitely like to talk about a lot, especially in our communities is um, at this deep feeling of being like very undereducated. You know, I think when you walk into a lot of these spaces, you're gonna find that the people that you are your colleagues have gone to Ivy League schools, they have had very different life experiences. And I think that um, what I wish I would have known back then was that was probably my strength um, that my life experience that was different from them was the thing that gave me a window into, I think, a sensitivity perhaps that um, some of my colleagues didn't have, or even a grit, a street smarts, you know, there's like all these things that you need to be a photographer or a filmmaker that you can't learn in school. You just can't, you know, a lot of your job is negotiating every minute of a day and trying to figure out how to get through the back door or a place where you don't belong really. And that's, that's, that's your power. So I think um, the, that, that for me was one of the big challenges that it took me a long time to overcome that even in, in my own mind. No, I, I completely agree. I, it's, it's actually a very American thing about like what college you go to. And for me, it's like, you see my, it's about being a good person and it's about like how hard you work and what the quality and your dedication. I completely agree. Cynthia, I could see your head nodding. What, what about you and your challenges? Um, I agree with Nadia in the sense of feeling like you, but so it's interesting. Like, I think I felt that internally, like not belonging, especially being around, like I don't have a photojournalism background or really a documentary background. I just kind of went into that myself. I have more of an art background. And originally I thought that that was kind of like a fault or it was gonna make things very difficult for me like moving forward or I was gonna have to like obviously work twice as hard to understand what was happening within people's projects and within storytelling. But I realized that that was actually extremely beneficial for me because obviously there is all different types of storytelling within art. And it was also really helpful within the BDC, like just the dynamic between having a lot of people that do have this photojournalism background and then me having this art background. 
I feel like it kind of brings this balance between the both worlds and it kind of within creating exhibitions and within photo editing and going through that whole process I feel like we kind of blend both of the worlds and it became something that I feel like is actually very beneficial and I think kind of unique for the BDC and what we show. Yeah Jasmine what about you? Oh you're muted. We're in the same built, like in the same office right now. <laughs> um, I I definitely hear a lot of what you're saying, Cynthia. Like I think um, I think for me, like a lot of it was a lot of it was like mentally, like, are you doing the right thing? Should you be doing this? Do you want to keep working in the arts? Does it make sense to have like a more stable job? Like, um. I feel like because kind of what I shared is like, I kind of like tried some things and then decided I want to do something different and, you know, you know, kind of like shifted around a little bit, a lot. Um, I think there was always this kind of nagging, like, are you equipped to do the thing that you're doing? And do you, I think there's a lot of like internal, like internal questioning of um, feeling uh, ready and good about the job that I was doing. And I think, um, yeah, that was, that was hard. And um, I think like, but I think kind of like shifting into different spaces and shifting into different jobs and kind of shifting into different hats and roles. Um, I would echo what you both said is like, I think that taught me flexibility. I think that taught me like learning how to figure things out and learning how to make other people that I work with feel comfortable and feel equipped and good to work on something together. Um, I think those are all like kind of skills that I've learned. And I think in photography in particular, um, I think I've, I've, I've never as a career been a photographer. I've never been the person with the camera taking the photos. And I think I, I questioned for a long time, like, what is my role? Like, what, what, what do I do? And it's probably like in the past, like two or three years that I feel more confident and comfortable being like, yeah, like what I do as kind of a supportive role of bringing to people together and kind of making space for stories and collaboration to happen, that that is valuable. And yeah, that's learning that what I do and learning that the skills that I have and the skills that I've developed are valuable has been a challenge and like a, a lesson. Yeah. And I've seen, and, and I feel like for us as an organization, you being able to go out and you having all these experiences has been such an asset to us. And I think people have to remember that is that your, your experiences, whether it's life, professional, creative is an asset to whoever you're working with at that moment. Um, Noel, what about, I mean, you've had so, I mean, you've, I mean, there have been challenges in the sense that like, I have always felt like this industry, if you want to call that is very insular. And I always felt like an outsider, like, how will I ever break through? So, you know, I think that that's the part too, is that there's, there have been very low moments where I'm like, it, this isn't going to happen for me, you know, even though, but I, I never, it's like, you just keep doing the work, you keep doing the work, you keep doing the work. And one day it like breaks open and you get a job, is, you know, uh, so I think that like question of keeping the faith, I mean, the reality is, you know, I, I have waited tables, I have shot weddings, I have like every imaginable hustle, like I am a hustler. It, I, I've never, I'll never lose the hustle. It's like once I have like, an, uh, and this is the other thing, like being really smart about alternate sources of income too, like you teach a little on the side, you know, you're willing to quietly shoot some portraits on the side. You might have some skill that like is totally not even relevant to the arts field per se, but you know, it just means that you can kind of like breathe a little easier and take care of the bills and just like, you know, know that one day it'll all kind of work out. I mean, I do feel, I feel very blessed that it all so far has worked out, but I have to say there were moments on that path that, you know, so I guess that's the other piece is that um, like really thinking about what it means to kind of make it in your own 
frame of mind or conception so maybe it is like oh my god winning like all these awards for films that's like incredible right 20 years ago looking back you maybe wouldn't have imagined that or you know but at the same time I think finding the like little pieces of joy on the road and in the process is really important too because it can be like there are some moments where you're just like oh man like you know, or, or like, let's say you're working, you know, every photographer knows this feeling. You've been working on a project for like five years, right? And then boom, the New York Times just publishes a story on like global hip hop. That, that happened to me, right? Like it happens all the time to photographers. So it's like, how do you maintain and kind of keep the faith and get, keep the faith and keep working towards the goal? So um, courage, as they say in French, like just, you know, keep going, find the joy and the pleasure in the everyday, you know, to the extent that you can. Um, that's what I love about the BDC. You guys have a whole vibe going on over there. Like <laughs> it's work, but I can also feel like, you know, it's like part of, you know, it's, it's social too. It's like, you know, you're building with people that you really respect and admire. And at Photoville, same thing. You have, so. to, you have to like the people you work with as well. I think it's important to be able to be able to trust the folks that you're working with. Trust is a big thing. Um, and that's part of your success. And I, and you know, I'm I am looking at the time, but I do want to ask a few more questions. And then we have a few more questions. We have a few questions from you who are watching today. But I do want to ask, what are people like? What are the some of the misconceptions that people have about your profession? I would say one for me, it's like you're making so much money. And then when I tell them I work other jobs, people freak out. But <laughs> that's a big misconception. Um, but Cynthia, what about you? What is a misconception about what you're doing? Um, I think the only thing I could say has to do with titles, like an exhibition manager or an exhibition coordinator, or it's probably the same case for all of us. And like, that's not the only thing you do. Like I don't manage, like I do manage the exhibition, but I like do it from beginning to end. And that's because we are a grassroots organization, but like, we, I collaborate on what we're going to actually show. I reach out to the photographers. I coordinate with them back and forth all the time. I edit photos. I actually print the photos. I help in framing and putting everything together. Um, I coordinate with volunteers that help me literally build and paint the walls and build the frames and like print and cut out captions. Like it's everything from being design, You design, you do the design work. Yeah, I do the design work. Um, mm. So I think it's a, it's, I think that, I mean, I don't mind that people don't know that. It's like, that's what I like doing and that's what I want to do. But I think that is probably a misconception. Yeah. It's important for people to know. What about you, Nadia? What's a misconception? Especially if you do. Uh, that there's any glamour at all in, in what I do. Um, I decided that the way I like, the way I make films is still the way I made films when I had no resources or budgets or anything like that. So carrying lots and lots of heavy bags, eating gross fast food at you know midnight when there's nothing else around, sleeping in scary hotels and just doing whatever it takes to you know, tell a story. So um, yeah, I think that's probably the biggest misconception, but it's still fun despite all those things. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree. What about you, Noel? Um, mine would be that, you know, the person on the receiving end of your application actually like loses, sometimes in my case, loses sleep about sending that rejection email. <laughs> That's what I would say. Like as much as it sucks to get the no thanks, but no thanks, like it's so hard to do it because inevitably there are a few resources. And I think that that's one of the things that I always felt like now that I was finally in a role or am in a role to say like, we can green light this or not green light that. Um, I don't think that feeling goes away. After having had to hustle so hard, I'm always like, oh, I know this is gonna sting, but for what it's worth, know that it's not, no, it's not something the administrators on the other side like take any joy or pleasure in and um and yeah, once again like don't get discouraged you know just keep applying keep keep working jasmine and i are nodding our heads because we're actually dealing with that right now losing sleep over that exact thing and we and and and, and noel to that point we all get rejected like the people who are and i would never say it's a rejection it's just like i always say it's not now nadia you're leaving but thank you 
Nadia has to leave. Thank you so much. Hi, thank you everyone. Good luck with everything. Stick to thank it. You. It's worth the journey. Trust me. All right. Bye. Thank you. We're very honored to, I mean, to have okay. someone like Nadia here. Thank you so much. Um, well, yeah, well, look, Jasmine and I are nodding heads, but like, again, like we are like the folks who I always say not now, like not because a lot of That's the a time, nice way to think of it. Yeah. Because I will tell you this, like going through the photo bowl proposals right now, which it's been such a hard month. There's so many great work, such great work. And now we're just really weighing on. And I know Cynthia feels the same way. Like when we're all doing this, it's like, it is, it's like, I would love to show this, but there's not enough time. There's not enough money, but there could be a project. And I would tell you, we're doing a whole bunch of projects right now and we're using work and we're working with photographers that we may have actually said not now, like a year ago or two years ago. So I think that's really something to think about. But Jasmine, what's a misconception about what you do? Maybe we can start answering some questions. Um, uh, probably I, looking at the photos of what we do, it's like we're outside all the time. There are so many people all around. 85% of the time, like my work is spreadsheets and emails and getting organized and communicating with people. And, um, and that's kind of, that's like how it all happens behind the scenes. Um, I think, um, yeah, I, I was actually thinking about how to kind of put a picture of my desktop or like what is on the tabs of my computer in the, in my slides. And I just couldn't figure out how to do that. Um, but yeah, I feel like any given moment I have like 20 tabs open and there's like a calendar and a few spreadsheets and uh, lots of different things. Um, yeah. Your, your screen, your um, desktop right now isn't pretty. <laughs> it's a lot going on. So I, you know, there are some few questions that I'd love to, um, for the panel to answer. And especially for any of you who had some questions for Nadia, we'll reach out to Nadia and see if she can answer them. And maybe we can do some social media stuff so she can answer those. Um, we can like put it on. But one of the questions I have is what advice do you have for an individual who is working in a field outside of the arts and is trying to make the switch transition to land an arts related job? At what, what point do you make the jump? And this is from Lizzie Sobel. I, I would say, I would suggest like the transferable skills piece I think is really important. So like learning about what your, your, uh, what your experience is and how it transfers into different like industries um, and also like study the industry you want to enter it's kind of like for people going to graduate school I always tell them like who do you want to study with like find out who you want to be around and then really think about like you know how to make that approach um, the institutions that you really respect uh, and look one thing that's really resonant here everyone that's here now is like these institutions were either small self-started or like, you know, you just like fell in love with it and stuck with it. Like, you know, I now work for a very big, you know, well, big, like Condé Nast, right? Like I worked for a big magazine. This is like the first time that that's been the case in my life. Um, but I'm just seeing it here, you know, just, it's really about like, think, think about the transferable skills and then trust that eventually, like I was hired to be a photo editor. I'd never been a photo editor before. So that's all credit to Joanna Milter, who was, you know, smart enough to know that like, just because you haven't done something before doesn't mean that, you know, you can't do it. But look for those people that maybe have come. Look at Laura. Laura's like, you know, theatrical production. And like she is the maven of photography in New York now because all of those transferable skills in terms of production and all the rest of it. So that'd be my advice. I agree. Play up on your skills. What are your skills? And then how can that help that organization? I was actually going to, um, to actually ask, and this is where I'll ask Jasmine and maybe even Cynthia, you may have that, but did you find yourself, did you ever find yourself out of photography and, and then find your way back into it? And how was that process? And maybe because I'm asking Jasmine, because I kind of know that for a little bit, were you looking at other things? Uh, You're a creative person, so it's not really a thing. Um, are, are you referring to once upon a time, I thought I was going to start a hummus company. 
Um, because I'm very disappointed was, about, by the way, because I thought it was so, it was so hard to find any job in the arts that I was like, I hummus food. I'll, I'll, I'll go down that path. Um, she was yeah. serving it. She was selling it at outside our gallery, by the way. So people would come to our gallery shows just to buy Jasmine's hummus. I made some like- good, I made some good, good hummus. Um, I think, you know, I think for me, like for all the many years that I was freelancing and doing different jobs, I found what was most like, what was most helpful was being able to find like of the freelance jobs of the many different things I was doing, finding one thing or something that is part-time that is like consistent enough that can cover the bills so that that's covered. And then and actually, ideally, like for that thing to be something that's not necessarily arts related, something that's not necessarily taking up the create the creative, the really like deep thinking part of my brain so that I can save that for the work that may not pay, but I really love, may not, I may not know that well, but I really want to experiment in. Um, so I mean, like, I think thinking about it incrementally too, of like, what can you kind of do to keep yourself financially secure um, and make a little bit of space to experiment and start doing in the arts and maybe start trying a couple different things to see when you make a jump, when you kind of build up to that place, what you want to do. Yeah, agree. Cynthia, do you have anything to add there? Yeah. Um- I mean, I didn't have a hummus experience, but I did work at a, a weirdly at a high end hardwood, hardwood flooring company for a while. Um, and that was right after I had interned at the BDC. And like I mentioned before, they couldn't hire me at the time. So I stayed at the hardwood flooring company and then like continued to volunteer. And then even when I got the call about working um starting the altered images exhibition i still worked at the flooring company for a little while just to like be like keep myself safe like you were saying jasmine um and then once things got like where i was like okay this is what i really need to put all of my creative focus on that was when i um, left the other job to continue with the bdc um but it was a while i was at the flooring company for well, it felt like a while. It was only two years, but it felt like forever. <laughs> but yeah, it was kind of like making sure I kept myself within, also within the community of the thing that I loved and kept myself around the people that like were photographers or we had those conversations or I could still go to those events and keep myself like in that world because that was really important to me. Yeah, I agree. Um, I joke with my neighbors who are clowns, who are performing artists, that you always have a bubble gig. So I, I, for the last 10 years, I've always had bubble gigs to keep us afloat. I have a small family. This doesn't pay all the bills. And so I agree. Um, And there's nothing wrong with that. There really isn't. There really is. We all have to eat. Um, So I want to wrap this up because it's been great. Honestly, we can go for hours um, and hopefully we'll be all be able to continue the conversation at another time. But um, someone's asked about like any photography courses recommended for adults with no prior photography experience. So I think, you know, do any of us have any like great places that folks can go to just quickly and then we'll wrap it up? I mean, I'd say maybe the ICP, but another thing might be also to just look at a lot of photography because half of like photography school is... uh, exposure to things and like take the research very seriously um go down the rabbit hole and learn about photographers and you know you might be surprised at how much uh self-education can actually happen and then there's always like you know like I said community colleges teach very good like intro courses I mean my god the BDC has a dark room my friends how I dream of the day I'll be able to like get in there um, does the BDC do classes, by the way? I mean, obviously, we're here with students, but I mean, like, a broad <laughs> public. <laughs> we, we do workshops sometimes, um, and I think we might, we haven't 
talked about it yet, but I think we might be doing, in terms of darkroom, I think we might be doing one soon. We haven't done anything recently because of COVID, but as that um, process like changes and as we're able to get more people back in, I think it's definitely something that we will do. Yeah. I think, I think there's definitely, there is ICP, BDC. I would even sign up for a lot of different, I mean, sign up to our newsletter because we're always sharing what everyone else is doing. And so I think it's like kind of getting connected to those folks in the community who are doing some great stuff. Our friends at Penumbra are also some, do some really great workshops, um, SVA, Continuing Ed. There's a lot, there's actually a lot out there. And also it depends on your budget. So kind of what Noelle said, if you don't really have that much money, right, start looking at things, start going to galleries, start going, like reading up on stuff, watching stuff online. It's really great. So we're at the end. We're already past the hour. But um, so I want to thank everyone for joining in. But, you know, Jasmine, Cynthia, Noelle, I'd love to kind of... Is there anything else that you want to say or like even like where do you each see yourselves in 10 years time? And then any advice for the folks who are still listening? I'll be in my 50s, which is fabulous. No, I don't know. I mean, who knows? I mean, for me, it's funny because now that I've been an administrator, I really want to be like the best administrator I can be because at the end of the day, you know, these questions of representation and like who has power and how historically, you know, white men have been in positions of power in the industry and whatever. Um, you know, I'd like to be in a position where I'm making change, always making change. And, you know, for me, that means like really becoming the best editor, administrator, producer that I can be. So that's mine. Mm -hmm. Great. Jasmine. Um, I, it's hard to think that far because if I think about 10 years ago, I don't know if I would have any picture of what I would be doing now. Um, what about I, five years? Well, I guess I would say like, I feel like the aha moments I've been having lately of like when I'm like, man, I really love what I'm doing is when I'm like with community members and I'm able to like set up a project, like set up a space where I can meet new people, I can meet new neighbors, like people can come together to work on a project together and meet people through that. And um, I think I wanna just keep doing that and learn more and more how to bring people in, how to make people comfortable, how to teach and kind of create spaces for people to do that. And I would love, I don't know, in five years that, mm -hmm that I start can kind of have a life of their own in the neighborhood. That would make me feel really good. Yeah, great. And Cynthia, what about you? Um, I also don't know, but I'm gonna say um, continuing what I'm doing now, but also maybe moving into a more supportive role because I like a little bit mentored our film fellows for our film fellowship program. And it's something that I actually really enjoy doing. So I think moving more into that and also continuing my own work. Yeah. Laura, you're not off the hook. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I, always joke, I joke and I, I mean, I always joke and say, but I'm serious. Like one day Jasmine's gonna run Photoville so I can then start my Lebanese cafe. And that's literally like all I wanna do. Um, no, I look, honestly, I think that this also shows everyone who's watching that we don't know. We don't know where we're going to be. We, like 10 years ago, who knew that we were going to be here at this point? And I think that especially if you're moving forward, it doesn't, know, it doesn't matter how old you are. Like you can always change direction because at the end of the day, and I think this is what this past year has shown us, life is way too short. And so we really need to do things that are not only make ourselves happy, but also that are fulfilling, but also kind of like we know we can sustain ourselves and you know this whole thing of like work-life balance and self-care is actually really important so um i just you know i hope everyone kind of got a little bit of something out of today and i hope we can continue the conversation whatever platform that ends up being hopefully it could be in person next time let's cross fingers 
Um, and I want to thank the BDC for having us because, uh, yeah, it's really nice to hold this space. Pretty great to have this group of people. Thank you. Thank you.